Hello everyone and welcome back to Greg Tech New Horizons. So we were working here in this area of their base last episode in order to finish off the quests in IV. There is a few crucial materials like Osmium and Ruridit which we're going to need in the next tier or LUV. We also added in our power substation here to buffer EU and we also worked on getting some crop processing for things like Salty Root to give us unlimited chlorine. I noticed that the super tank which buffers chlorine is currently full so we're going to upgrade this to the maximum tier. We're also going to add in some drawer upgrades here. So we replaced the tank of chlorine right here. We're going to get a huge debuff from this, but that's okay. It's worth it. <laughs> We're going to be able to handle so much more chlorine with this. I've also noticed here our drives are filling up a little bit at ore processing. So let's add a few more upgrades to these to start us off today as well. I got some more drives currently being crafted, but let's talk about some of our goals for this episode. The next major goal of the pack is to unlock the assembly line. I'm sure a lot of you guys will, will be familiar with the assembly line. We worked with this in Interactions and also in Omni Factory. Although from what I understand, it works slightly differently here. In any case, this multi block is definitely not cheap as as is becoming a common theme here, right? <laughs> and the bulk of the cost comes with these assembly machine casings, which take seven ZPM circuits each. And we need a total of 15 of these machine casings. But that's not all the cost involved with this multi-block. We also have the assembly line casings, which take two robot arms each. And this is going to be lots and lots of tungsten steel, tungsten and graphene. So I'm not sure if we'll necessarily be beeline in this thing, but um, more or less everything we're going to be doing is going to be in service of being able to obtain this assembly line. So we're going to start this slightly daunting task by at least unlocking the quest for it. We need the master quantum computer and the quantum processor mainframe. So we do have the LUV quantum computer available to us, or at least on autocraft. There's no way currently I know for a fact that we <laughs> we can craft the required amount. But um, let, yeah, let's put in all the recipes and see exactly what we're missing here. Alright, you guys want to see the damage? It's pretty bad. <laughs> As I suspected. So, starting with the assembly line casings, we need 11 of these things. This one, to be fair, actually isn't too bad. We're just missing some polyphenylene sulfide, which is just a buffer issue. We actually have this fully automated. Although, looking at the recipe for these things, I mean, this does eat a lot of wafers, which I'm a little bit concerned about. But alright, what about the 21 great machine casings? No problem at all. This is probably the cheapest part of this, so we're actually just going to order these right now. However, this is where things get a little bit uh, sketchy here. <laughs> so let's try to order these 15 assembly machine casings. Uh oh. This isn't what you like to see. <laughs> Alright, we're going to start with a clean pin screen here. And this is going to be a matter of pinning things and picking it up as we need it. So we're short about 9,000 carbon. Call it 10,000 carbon. About 1,000 aluminium some tantalum, steel ingots, energetic alloy, silicon rubber, fiber reinforced epoxy resin. Oh man, look at how many platinum wire that is. 30,000 fine platinum wire. We're short random access memory, nor memory. And I think that's about it, yeah. So nine items we are short here. Oh boy. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Oh hey, look, the great machine casing's finished already. Let's call this our little project chest. Alright, first thing we're going to do is batch a whole lot of the silicon bulls. That number that you saw there that we were missing is actually a lot higher since we don't have recipes for the random access memory or the NOR, which we'll get to today. We're going to need a long term solution for the wafers, but I, to be honest I don't really know what we should do about that right now. So let, <laughs> let's tackle this carbon issue. So to fix the carbon, we're going to make use of all the charcoal we've been accumulating. We get charcoal out of our pyrolyze ovens here and we have 1800 stacks in this one and another couple of hundred in this one here. So all we have to do here is actually add some storage buses onto these drawers and we'll make these high priority and extract only. Please tell me we have some channels down here. Mm, I think we're going to be short one. We need some more dense cable up till here at least. Alright, I fixed the channels over there with the storage buses. What we're going to do here is place a drawer for the output and all of this charcoal we're going to send through a macerator first of all and into an electrolyzer. Oh boy, that is loud. Oh no, <laughs> we need a muffler upgrade. Basically all this charcoal we're just going to pulverize and electrolyze. There's nothing that I really particularly want to keep charcoal for. And this is, I was considering doing the multi-block for this, but honestly this is pretty fast as is. 
So we are just going to let this thing fill up the drawer and we'll place a storage bus on the bottom of this. Alright, so we should see our carbon supplies going up steadily here. And I think we're more or less safe to take this off our list. Uh oh, we got maintenance issues. Alright, what's the problem here? Circuitry? <laughs> Where's the maintenance hatch? I don't even remember where I put that thing. That hasn't happened in a while. Anyways, for the majority of these wafers that we're missing, the NOR and the random access memory, I believe it has to be inside a clean room. The RAM doesn't have to be, but I think the NOR probably does. And there's actually quite a few that we're missing as well. So rather than actually do it in their clean room and expand our clean room, we are going to build another one of these things. My favourite machine in the game, the processing array. So if you put any machine inside the processing array, it counts as if it's in a clean room. We just have to actually build the thing, and I think I'm going to put recipes in for, at this point. Like that? Oh yeah, we need the Lapatronic Energy Orb. Ah uh -huh, yeah, we should probably automate this at this point. I think the thing we're missing for this energy orb is the engraved Lapatron chips, at least the recipe for this thing. And we can reuse one of our precision laser engravers that we eventually move to the, the processing array for this step specifically. And then to make the Lapatron chips, which we need to engrave, we can add the assembler recipe, this, this is just an easy step, and the raw Lapatron we can do in an autoclave with Vibrant Alloy. We are going to repurpose this one here which used to be for carbon fibers, but we actually have those on passive, and they are automatically being produced in this autoclave here. Alright, after putting in some recipes, I think this is now requestable. We will also need the robust tungsten steel machine casings, which we should have enough for, although it's probably not a bad idea to mix up some more tungsten steel dust. Alright, so we're still waiting on a few more casings for the multi-block, but uh, where do we actually want to place this thing is the question. We are going to need quite a lot of applied energistics channels for this, and you'll see why in a second. But I'm thinking that we actually put it through here and we develop this room a little bit. It's looking a little bit empty with just the alloy blast miller. Alright, more on this setup in a second, but I did manage to get all of this processing array set up here. So inside the PA we are using two EV precision laser engravers. I totally just take, took those from our clean room, which used to sit right around here. And when you're setting this up, you want this on distinct input bus mode, or separated input buses. Since we want the laser engravers to obey the lens that the item is also in. So if you have that setting on false, then it will, I think, just pick any lens and you'll end up with a random item in your output slots. But yeah, basically all of these are just the flat interfaces, and each one corresponds to a different lens type. While I was setting this up, I did also add some extra patterns as well, like the central processing unit. We can make engraved diamond chips, power ICs, which are used in a lot of the energy hatches, engraved Lapatron chips. But of course, we do have our random access memory, and the NOR memory chip, which uses EnderEye. So all along the outside is the input buses, and this one here is the output bus, and this will take from the conduit and put back in the ME interface, which will complete our craft. Very basic setup, but yeah, it works really well actually, and we can upgrade this PA in the future if we need to. Currently we're running this at EV, and yeah, we just have the two machines in there at the moment. I think all we're missing now for the random access memory and NOR memory is the cutting machine recipe, since the laser engraver produces the wafer and those have to go through the cutting machine to make the memory chips. Alright, so that's two more items off of our pinned list here. As you can see, it has grown a little bit. So I thought since we are going to need so many circuits for this, and it does take some of the previous tier as well. Yeah, if we double check the crafting screen here, it's somewhere in the region of like 1500 boards. And the requirement for circuit boards isn't going to go away after we craft this either. We need these basically all throughout the game. The problem with these things are is they are very, very slow in the chemical reactor. Right now, I think it's this guy right here that handles all of this processing. Uh, we're currently doing all of these on demand. However, this layout that I've planned here is going to handle all of our circuit boards and we're going to make them fully passive, which is going to be a lot of work. This is going to take forever. <laughs> I think also a worthwhile detour though. 
So if we take a look at the circuit boards, there is quite a few of them, but we're only going to be doing the advanced, the plastic, and the more advanced circuit boards today. Although, you know, I have left room for the rest of those things. All of the circuit boards are going to take some fluid and also some foil of various metals. So the foil we are going to make over here. Let's start with the plastic board. So for this, we need the chemical reactor with copper foil and iron 3. The iron 3 we have automated already. That is produced over here. This should automatically stay full of iron 3 chloride, which just leaves us with the polytetrafluoroethylene sheets, which I think we're already producing, aren't we? Yeah, those are being solidified right here, so we have those on passive already, which just leaves the foil, actually, which is what these bending machines are for. So I've ran up some HV power. This is a high-amp transformer going into 8x al blue alloy cable. We have an interface here, which is going to supply our copper ingots. Now, copper is not something we have fully passive yet, since we don't have any access to something like a void miner. But this we are going to filter in the first bending machine and extract on brown. Okay, so this guy's filling up with copper. We want this on circuit one, I believe. To make copper foil, we have to bend it twice. So we have to go once into the copper plate and then one more bending machine into the copper foil, which is why we have two pair. It would also help if I plug these machines in. Oh, and these are going to be very loud. Oh no. <laughs> we need to get mufflers for all of these. So the reason we have a drawer in between as well is I want to be able to buffer the plates, the plate form. Since we're making them here anyway, we may as well have them buffered and have them in a storage drawer. So these are automatically going to be sent to the bottom side. That will buffer in the drawer. I'm not sure if we want to keep 512 plates. Although, hold on, they didn't add the storage downgrade in the new patch, did they? No. No, we still don't have these things, unfortunately. <laughs> Please, GTNH, give us the storage downgrades. Okay, we'll just deal with the bigger buffers, I think. Maybe on some of the higher tier materials, we'll have to do something about this. But copper for us at this point is not really an issue. We have 7,000 dust. And remember, there's some other things like malachite, I think, which also turn into copper. And we have like 6,000 odd dust of this as well. So, so we're going to have a conveyor module for imports. That should pull the plates into the second bend machine. We want this also on circuit one and plug it in. And this will create our copper foil for us. Also output this to the drawer and I think we're done for copper. The other materials we have to do this for is gold, electrum, aluminium and energetic alloy. Like so. Yeah, one of the solutions that I, I saw some guys in the Discord using actually is using these 2x2 two two drawers, which don't hold as much obviously as the 1x1. One one. So the 1x1 one by, one by default holds 4096, which is going to be fine for copper, but for these ones right here, we're just holding, I think it's 1024 that these things hold. Although that's probably a bit much for energetic alloy right now, considering we definitely don't have the production of energetic alloy dust or ingots passive. And in fact, energetic alloy is one of the items on our pin list here. We're missing like it's somewhere in the region of 4,000. The majority, I think, is actually for this process anyway. So yeah, from what I can tell for the circuit boards, there is two more foils that we need. Like, for example, neutronium and niobium titanium. But those are so far off that I'm not, I'm like not even going to worry about that right now. <laughs> and when we eventually do them, we'll, I guess we'll put them on the sides right here. I don't know. So yeah, now that we have the foils for each of these circuit boards, we need six large chemical reactors. For each circuit board, like for example, the plastic, we need this step which is the iron three step with copper foil. And we also need the blank plastic board itself, which takes sulfuric acid and the foil. And I think all the boards are almost the same. All of them take sulfuric acid, some variation of the foil, and then iron three chloride to finish them off. Oh, this is so weird. For some reason, I can't craft maintenance hatches anymore. I don't know if just all the tools broke at once in the ME system, or if something broke in the new patch. I have no idea. But there's no alternate re recipes for these, so I guess we're crafting more, more uh, tools for these things. <laughs> But yeah, all of the LCRs are going to sit right around here. And I'm thinking something like this can work for us. So right now we're just doing the three boards. I think we got all the IO set. We have two input buses, an input hatch, and an output bus for each one. And I'm also thinking that we run these at MV since they will be passive and we don't have infinite power yet. I do have some plans for our power. Do have to increase our power production, not just our power storage. Although I didn't check, can we do all of these at LV? I think we can, right? Yeah, I'm sure all the recipes can be run at LV, so we'll run them all at MV, I think. I think the rest of these just have to be casing blocks. Anyways, we're gonna need some applied energistics connections down here, so I have added a fresh P2P channel right here. And I've also run a interface and a fluid P2P for each. I think we're gonna group them in twos. And the reason we have such awkward space in here is just because of the, the length of this, this part right here. 
I didn't really know how else to lay them out, and also because of the chunk boundaries. There is a chunk boundary right here, and I would rather keep them off the chunk boundary. So to set the filler, we're going to need a cell of sulfuric acid. This is actually running low a little bit. We may need, we. This is actually just a byproduct of fuel desulfurization. We may need to set up a specific LCR just to make sulfuric acid. I think we should be able to do that with sulfur, right? Yeah, sulfur, oxygen, water. But not today. I think we... <laughs> there's too many things for us to do today. Oh yeah, we'll also need the iron 3. So we have to decide here. I think that all of the top LCRs are going to take the sulfuric acid. We can filter this in on brown channel. It should fill up with sulfuric acid. Same for all three. And the bottom LCR will receive the iron 3 chloride, which has chlorine in it for some reason. That is why you set the filters before you put, place the P2P down. Alright, we got the fluid set. We now need to filter in our copper foil, which is not in our ME system. I think we're missing storage buses right here. Assuming we have enough channels. This is taking a while. I'm not sure we do. <laughs> I've been actually having troubles with the ME network recently. And that it takes just forever to calculate anything. And it results in some of the, some of the channels around the base just disappearing. Oh, there we go. We got the channels online now. These are going to be high priority, and I think we'll leave them on bi-directional. Alright, so now that should give us copper foil. We also need the Teflon sheets. And because we have ULV input buses, it means it will only buffer one stack in each. And we're just going to put one item in each of these buses. And extract on brown. Alright, so that should be all the I.O. set. We got the fluid the, and the two input items for these. I think all we need to do now is hook up the power and filter the rest of these things. Ah, we have for circuit board automation complete. So right here we are buffering more advanced, advanced and plastic circuit boards. And then on all of the output buses we have the item detector cover, which will only turn the machine off if the output bus is empty. And then from the bottom output bus it goes into the drawer controller which just sits right below these drawers right here. So yeah, basically so long as we have the foil and also the solidified boards, which we make right here, we are going to have circuit boards for us and no more waiting on these things because... <laughs> Those things take forever, and we are still just running these things at MV. So I actually took the power here from this IV line. That is transformed down to HV and then to MV on each block of the LCRs right here. So yeah, it's actually a pretty simple setup here. I don't think we're going to have to modify too much with these. We may have to overclock in the future. But the biggest thing with this is being able to produce enough foil. Mainly foil. We'll keep an eye on the sulfuric acid, I don't think that's going to be a problem. And the epoxy, I don't think is going to be a problem either. Epoxy production I think is pretty robust for us, I think it's made over here somewhere. Yeah, right here is epoxy. Time will tell, I guess. Time will tell. <laughs> but yeah, let's um... Oh, we've actually stopped here. Uh, what is the problem here? We're out of foil? We're not out of foil, we have plenty of foil here. Mm, there's something weird going on with the AE system. I've had this blinking issue all day, I, I really don't know what the problem is either. We're definitely supplying enough power to this thing. Okay, after some digging, let me see if I can show you, you guys what is going on here. It will randomly occur where some of the nodes here actually appear offline, even though there is power and channels available. Right there, you see this? This top interface here is offline, even though all the other ones that it's connected to is online. And now randomly it just goes back online again. So the only thing I can think of is our controller is now in our chunk boundary, which was a bit silly. <laughs> I didn't realize I'd actually done this, to be honest, when I rebuilt this. So I may be rebuilding the controller today again. Again, <laughs> I'm not sure. Let's uh, let's put that off for now though. We can deal with a blinking ME system, but not long term. This is going to have to get sorted out. Checking the recipe again for our machine casings that we checked at the start of the episode. We are also missing silicon rubber and fiber reinforced epoxy resin. This epoxy resin sheet will effectively be fixed once the buffer catches up on the circuit boards over there. But the silicon rubber is something completely different. So I think, oh, we have channels offline as well here. Uh, and now they're back online. <laughs> yeah, look, this one's offline, this one's online. Yeah, all we have to do, I think, for this is increase the level emitter. We'll make it like 512 silicon rubber sheets. We are also missing raw carbon fiber, which we produce here. I think this should be an easy fix, actually. We can replace the storage bus that we have on here. And instead, we'll make it a level emitter with a machine controller attached to it. And I think this also means we'll have to send this back into our drives as well. So this is extract on purple, we need to filter purple inside our interface down here. And we'll set this level emitter to like 6000. When we're below 6000 it will emit a redstone signal and turn on the machine again. So I put the mixed energetic alloy through our blast furnace here, I think it's 5 seconds the way we have this configured. I'm actually really really liking the look of these HSS-S coils. 
It's really actually grown on me. But once these are cooked, it's going to make all of the circuit boards. In fact, you can see the LCR is now turned on. But the next thing I want to look at is making more blast furnaces. We are going to need lots more blast furnaces. There's absolutely no way we can get all of them that I would like to get today. So I think these are the materials we're going to settle on for, at least for the time being, to put on passive. We're going to do steel, aluminium, titanium, energetic alloy, vibrant alloy, pulsating iron, and tungsten steel. We may switch out pulsating iron with black steel or something. I'm not sure. It's... It's kind of a toss-up. There's so many materials we have to put through these things. <laughs> the issue, though, is the coil blocks, right? Because the tungsten steel, I think, has the highest requirement. Tungsten steel requires at least 3,000 heat capacity. So we're going to have to do it at least nichrome or above. Yeah, nichrome or above. It would be really ideal if we could get something like tungsten steel coils. Or even HSSG to fill out this whole block. Okay, after some calculations, we need a total of 76 coil blocks in order to fill out the, the amount of blast furnaces that we have laid out here. 76 coils is 152 ingots of... I guess we're going for HSSG. We're apparently one tungsten dust short. We can get that. <laughs> And I guess we'll also need 76 ingots of molten tungsten steel as well in order to make the coils. How long does it take for us to cook at least one of these things? 90 seconds per ingot. That's over three hours of blast furnace work to do. Actually, you know what? We may as well use two blast furnaces. I'm sure we've got nitrogen in this one as well. This is only 45 seconds. So yeah, it's going to be significantly less than three hours, but still a very long time. <laughs> Alright, I think my calculations on the dust there was way, way off. <laughs> we only have one set of blast furnaces, well, two sets, two blast furnaces available to us right now. I also made some changes to the way we were wall sharing these things. So, before we had them, every other block was a blast furnace controller. Well, we can't do that with the addition of the maintenance hatch, since this has to be on its own block on the blast furnace. So, we're basically doing them in pairs. So, we have two blast furnaces, and then another two full blast furnaces up till here, and then the last set of two blast furnaces. So we lost space for one, all in all, which I think I'm gonna avoid doing pulsating iron. That will just continue to do it on demand. But I did get all the fillers set underneath here, so we have fluid P2P for fluids, and the EBF supply interface for the dusts. A lot of these, like the tungsten steel and, and vibrant alloy, we will have to passive next episode, since we no have no way of producing the dusts automatically. Although things like alumina, we are absolutely swimming in from ore processing. We have 50,000 dust, which still has to be smelted down. So the first one is doing steel. We are inputting iron dust and also oxygen in here. This is going to be on circuit 11, which I actually forgot the circuits. And the machine controller will let the blast furnace run with a redstone signal. So when we are below 5,000 steel, this will emit and turn on our blast furnace. Not sure about the number of 5,000 though. I may increase that quite a bit more since we, we go through quite a lot of steel. In fact, this may even turn on. No, we're missing the circuit, that's right. The second one here is doing aluminium. I nearly said aluminium there. That's not right. <laughs> aluminium, which is alumina plus carbon. No fluid for this one. And again, we'll set this quite high. We'll maybe go like 10,000. And so all of these blast furnaces share the output bus here, which is in the middle. This is going to be extract on blue. And this is just going to go straight back into our interface here. We also got the IV muffler hatches, which are very expensive still, but I think worth it for the pollution prevention. And yeah, that's basically it. We are just waiting on the coils, really. <laughs> the only other odd one out is the titanium, which I think is this one here. So we're actually using two recipes for the titanium. We have a couple thousand titanium dust, which we get from ores, and that is smelted with nitrogen. However, you can also get titanium if you do the magnesium dust and tetrachloride. So we actually just filter both in, and we're going to let the EBF pick which recipe it runs. The tetrachloride chloride is made over here whenever we get rutile. Basically just a different form of the ore, which also gives us titanium. And then yeah, the energetic alloy, the vibrant alloy, and the tungsten steel dust. We have to figure out the passive automation of the dust next episode. But I think this is a good point to wrap up this one. So in all the time we've been uh, crafting all, all the EBS over there, we're up to 274 circuit boards, which really isn't that much to be honest. It's just that we're out of the energetic alloy. 
And the other ones here are still plodding away. I think we're actually out of gold, though, is the only problem on the other one. But yeah, we are getting there very slowly, very slowly. <laughs> but all this infrastructure is necessary, and it's going to help us in the future as well. Thank you for all your comments last episode, by the way. I, it's good to be back after, after the little week off that I had. So yeah, thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you all soon for some more Greg Tech New Horizons.